Herman Melville's Moby Dick is many things. It starts off as like this friendship story between Ishmael and Quakeweg, and then at some point early in the book, uh, Ishmael and Quakeweg go to sea on the Pequot, and the tone of the story shifts, and it becomes like this very strange, surreal, out of time dream experience at sea. And on the boat, there's this narrative surrounding Captain Ahab and his desire for the white whale. But at the same time, Ishmael is constantly interjecting different flashbacks, different experiences he, he's had in the past. And specifically, most of these interjections are material to the fact that Ishmael wants to teach us everything he knows about whales. And one of the really cool things about Moby Dick is that as Ishmael constructs this narrative, he's self-conscious and he talks to us about this act of construction. It's a book that's in many ways aware of its own constructedness. And so Ishmael gives writing advice. We get writing advice in Moby Dick. So what are the pieces of writing advice that we get? So the first one comes at the end of chapter 32, Cytology. So it's early in the book. And this is one of those like notoriously boring chapters because he's, he's going on and on about all the different types of whales. He's categorizing them and their sizes and their relationships. And we get to the end here. And at the end of this chapter, Ishmael says that this is incomplete. This is not a complete enumeration of all the animals that I would have liked to cover. Quote, it was stated at the outset that the system would not be here and at once perfected. You cannot but plainly see that I have kept my word, but I now leave my cytological system standing thus unfinished, even as the great cathedral of Cologne was left with the crane still standing upon the top of the uncompleted tower. For small erections may be finished by their first architects, grand ones, true ones, ever leave the copestone to posterity. God keep me from ever completing anything. This whole book is but a draft, nay, but a draft of a draft. O oh, time, strength, cash, and patience." End quote. And so, of course, your mileage may vary, but the advice here is that when your themes are sufficiently ambitious, you don't need to finish. It's not about finishing. And there's something very profound about this because Moby Dick is such a weird book and it feels like a collage, like a mixture of like different literary threads. And it does in a way have that kind of unfinished feeling to it. A second instance where Ishmael talks to us about this project, this writing project, he talks to us about the construction of this very book that we're holding is in chapter 104, The Fossil Whale. And it's another example of Ishmael trying to tell us about the skeleton of a whale. And in doing so, he's going to talk about his word choices. So, quote, Applied to any other creature than the Leviathan, to an ant or a flea, such portly terms might justly be deemed unwarrantably grandiloquent. But when Leviathan is the text, the case is altered. Fain am I to stagger to this enterprise under the weightiest words of the dictionary." End quote. And so he's saying, for the Leviathan, only the weightiest, most portly words will do. And he now elaborates, continuing, and here be it said, that whenever it has been convenient to consult one in the course of these dissertations, I have invariably used a huge quarto edition of Johnson. So I'll interject, 
Ishmael is referring to Johnson, Dr. Samuel Johnson's Dictionary of the English Language, which is this 18th century dictionary that Samuel Johnson wrote, the first dictionary of the English language, and it's like a massive book. Ishmael loves Samuel Johnson. Samuel Johnson makes a number of appearances in this book. But one of the things, the strange affinities actually, between Dr. Samuel Johnson and Ishmael is that they are both obsessed with ghosts. James Boswell's Life of Samuel Johnson is filled with discussions and anecdotes of Dr. Johnson thinking about ghosts and instances and testimonies that people have of seeing ghosts. And so Ishmael also is obsessed with ghosts. And there's lots and lots of ghosts in um, Moby Dick. But one example, one example of the ghosts in Moby Dick is at the end of chapter 69, titled The Funeral. And he describes what happens to the corpse of a whale that's left at sea. And he goes into detail about how it's, it's a pretty ghostly kind of thing hovering in the water. And sailors and even animals stay away from it because it's terrifying. And he ends the chapter, quote, Are you a believer in ghosts, my friend? There are other ghosts than the Cock Lane one and far deeper men than Dr. Johnson who believe in them. End quote. In addition to being obsessed with ghosts, Dr. Johnson has a reputation for using very big words and being very pedantic in his writing. So just to give you two examples from uh, Johnson's dictionary, these are some of the famous Johnsonian definitions that give you a sense of his style. And this is relevant to us because this is kind of the, the style that Ishmael says he's consciously trying to emulate. So Dr. Johnson's definition for the word essay Quote, a loose sally of the mind, an irregular, indigested piece, not a regular and orderly composition. Another example, uh, famous Johnsonian definition, the definition of network. Quote, anything reticulated or desiccated at equal distances with interstices between the intersections. End quote. And in James Boswell's Life of Samuel Johnson, we actually get James Boswell gives us some of the parodies that would emerge of Johnson's style. Because Johnson's style was so recognizable and to many people comedic basically, so over the top, so extra. So this is um, late in the life of Samuel Johnson. This is a whole section Boswell has about all the imitators of the style. And so this is, these are some of the parody definitions that someone created the definition for higgledy-piggledy, conglomeration and confusion. Hodgepodge, a culinary mixture of heterogeneous ingredients applied metaphorically to all discordant combinations. Ding-dong, tabulary chimes used metaphorically to signify dispatch and vehemence. End quote. Another well-known feature of Samuel Johnson is that he loved the sport, the fighting debates that he would get into, these verbal fights. And he could like almost never be bested in them because he was so smart and so witty and sharp. And he would like yell. He would get up and be like almost violent in his debating. And he would like shout you down, sometimes with arguments, sometimes with just his like massive size and presence. And there's actually one of the extracts at the very beginning of Moby Dick, before the book starts, is a scene from James Boswell's life of Samuel Johnson. And it's a scene where, in one of these rare occasions, someone gets in a nice little jab, a nice witty remark at Johnson's expense, which Boswell makes very clear to us is very rare. And so I'll, I'll read the quote in full from James Boswell's Life of Samuel Johnson, not just the abbreviated extract in Moby Dick. So Boswell tells us, quote, Goldsmith, however, was often very fortunate in his witty contests, even when he entered the lists with Johnson himself. And so I'm skipping a bit, but they're talking about writing fables. And so Goldsmith says that when you write fables, it's important to write it 
in a sort of simplistic language with simplistic modes of thinking. And Johnson says it's very easy to write fables. Anyone can write fables. And so now Goldsmith gets in his zinger. He gets in his witty remark at Johnson's expense. He says, Why, Dr. Johnson, this is not so easy as you seem to think. For if you were to make little fishes talk, they would talk like whales. End quote. Ishmael continues, I have invariably used a huge quarto edition of Johnson expressly purchased for that purpose, because that famous lexicographer's uncommon personal bulk more fitted him to compile a lexicon to be used by a whale author like me. One often hears of writers that rise and swell with their subject, though it may seem but an ordinary one. How then, with me, writing of this Leviathan, unconsciously, my chirography expands into placard capitals. So there he's talking about his handwriting. His handwriting gets, gets bigger. Give me a condor's quill. Give me Vesuvius's crater for an inkstand. Friends, hold my arms. For in the mere act of penning my thoughts of this Leviathan, they weary me and make me faint with their outreaching comprehensiveness of sweep, as if to include the whole circle of the sciences and all the generations of whales and men and mastodons past, present, and to come, with all the revolving panoramas of empire on earth and throughout the whole universe, not excluding its suburbs. Such and so magnifying is the virtue of a large and liberal theme. So that's Ishmael's message, the importance, the virtue of a large and liberal theme, the power of a large theme. Ishmael continues, we expand to its bulk. To produce a mighty book, you must choose a mighty theme. End quote. Thanks for watching.